Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode 149, Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be ranting away at things that are important to me uh, and I think are worthy of your attention. Comments, questions, reactions can be sent to me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, uh, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a dark time. You can get the web, uh, the email address from there, or you can leave a comment there if you prefer. Uh, just one thing, if you do send me email, please be sure to include something like you know, your cable show, something so that it's clearly not spam in the in the subject line, uh, and be a little patient about getting an answer because I'm a little slow about it, but you will get an answer. All right, with those traditional introductions out of the way, we're going to go straight to it. We're going to start, as I always like to when I can, with some good news. And in this case, the news really, it does my heart good. Uh, the world is winning the war against polio. Polio, once a feared disease worldwide. Uh, I had an uncle who had polio, in fact. As recently as the 1980s, polio was found in 100 nations and it paralyzed 350,000 people every year. But polio is now being driven to near extinction. As a symbol of that, just over a month ago, India recognized a uh, uh, mark three years since its last new case of polio as a success achieved by a massive and ongoing immunization program. Between 2009 and, two, uh, and 2011, uh, the number of new cases in India was driven from 741 to one, and now zero. In 2012, there were just 175 new cases of polio in the entire world, with all but five of those occurring in just three countries, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nigeria, where the disease is still considered endemic. Still, there is concern that despite all that effort, polio could make a comeback. Uh, in 2013, there were 372 new cases worldwide, mostly in conflict areas like Somalia and Syria, where the, and these are areas where polio had previously been eradicated. At the same time, however, even with that, uh, polio cases are still falling in those three countries where it's considered endemic. A representative of the World Health Organization said that if the current trends of progress continue, we could easily see the end of polio in Afghanistan and Nigeria in 2014. And wouldn't that be something? All right, uh, from the good to the bad, uh, we have an episode of our occasional feature, The Unintentional Humor. This is a case where something that's not supposed to be funny just is. But in this case, the humor is of the very bitter sort. Um, first, we have John Kerry going on Face the Nation to condemn Russia's actions in Ukraine by saying how in the 21st century, you don't just invade another country on a completely trumped up pretext. This is from the Secretary of State of a nation that just over two years ago finally and unwillingly withdrew its forces from a nation that it invaded in the 21st century in 2003 on a completely trumped up pretext. Meanwhile, we have the Russian Foreign Ministry saying at a time when Russia has invaded the Crimea and uh, still threatens to invade eastern Ukraine that Quoting, unilateral actions do not fit the standards of civilized relations between states. What was it you saying last week about how power corrupts and being in a position of power makes you think that your concerns are the only ones of any importance? All right, moving from the sublimely ridiculous to the merely ridiculous, we have one of our regular weekly features. It's the Clown Award, given as always for meritorious stupidity. This week, the big red nose goes to Dr. Roy Spencer, one of the world's most often cited deniers of the risks of human-driven climate change. Now, I'm going to be talking more about some recent news about global warming next week. Uh, but right now, this, this is not about global warming. This is about Roy Spencer. Uh, 
Now, Spencer has a BS in atmospheric, science, uh, atmospheric sciences, I should say, uh, and a PhD in meteorology, and has published climate-related articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals, so he has legitimate claim to be a uh, climate scientist. One of that extremely rare breed of climate scientists who don't believe in human-driven climate change. Which is why, even if you don't pay a lot of attention to this, you may have heard of Roy Spencer, the name may ring a bell, because the thing is, when the right wing wants somebody with any credentials at all in order to go out and publicly oppose the notion of human-driven climate change, they don't have a lot of options. So um, Roy gets a lot of face time. In fact, he's testified before Congress on four separate occasions. Now, the thing is, though, I have to tell you, and here's the, here's the point here, that if he heard me talking about him just now, he would be shuddering with outrage at my language because I called him a climate change denier. Now, on his blog recently, Spencer vented his fury at being called a denier. I mean, even though he denies human-driven climate change, in fact, he denies the ability of humans to significantly affect the climate at all. But no matter... What he declared on that post is that by calling people like him a denier, I and anyone else who ever uses the term are indirectly equating them with Holocaust deniers. That's repulsive and extremist, he says, and he's not going to put up with it anymore. So he's going to call anyone who uses the term denier, he's going to call them a global warming Nazi. Now. When some folks wondered about calling people Nazis at the same time you're offended by the term denier, um, Spencer, who, by the way, is also a creationist, uh, doubled down and said, in effect, oh, no, 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 that's okay because they really are like Nazis. Well, I tell you what, Roy, if you're really that offended by the term denier, maybe you'd prefer my name for people like you, Nanny Nanny Naysayer. In any event, Roy Spencer, you are a clown. All right, I've got uh, several updates now about things I've talked about recently, news coming up on this. Uh, and the first two uh, actually refer to updates about the Keystone XL pipeline, which I've talked about a couple of times recently. Uh, you may recall that about a month ago, the State Department released its final environmental impact statement on the pipeline and um, that I was critical of it. And one of the things I slammed about it was its conclusion that the Keystone pipeline would not significantly affect overall greenhouse gas emissions, greenhouse gases being the ones that cause global warming, that it would not significantly affect overall emissions because the oil would be just transported by some other means if the pipeline's not built. Now, first I said that the, uh, I said the State Department was trying to change the actual subject. Uh, they didn't want to talk about global warming, so they wanted to focus just on the physical item of the pipeline without any regard to what it would be transporting. Uh, under the assumption, uh, well later on I criticized the assumption that um, you know, if the pipeline's not built, the same gunk would just be sent another way. Um, and just as a quick reminder, I use the term gunk deliberately. These are tar sands from Alberta, Canada being transported to refineries in Texas. Tar sands are about the dirtiest, most environmentally polluting way to get oil that there is. Uh, in fact, it's so sick, thick and gunky that you have to melt it, in essence, in order to get it to flow through a pipeline. All right, well, anyway, the thing is that right now, the, uh, the Carbon Tracker Initiative, which is based in the United Kingdom, this is a group that focuses on how carbon budgets interact with financial markets. And they looked at that same State Department conclusion that I just mentioned and thought the same thing I did. Of course, they could actually critique it with actual detailed analysis, didn't have to rely on intuition, but, you know. Well, according to that analysis that they made, the State Department's uh, impact statement downplays the significance of the pipeline and what it would have for the development of Canadian tar sands and thereby underestimated the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that would come as a result of that development. 
In short, the State Department uh, concluded that approval or denial of any specific project, any, any oil transport project, including the Keystone XL pipeline, is unlikely to significantly impact the rate of extraction of tar sands. Carbon Tracker calls this the significance trap. The pipeline is only deemed insignificant because the State Department's report didn't consider the ways having the pipeline would affect production of the tar sands. Now oversimplifying, grossly oversimplifying here just for the sake of brevity, the idea shipping oil by rail costs more than shipping it by pipeline. So when you include the transportation cost, the, the cost per unit of production, so, you know, think of the cost per barrel of oil to get it from production to get it to the refinery, is higher if you ship it by rail than if you ship it by pipeline, so your profit is less, you produce less. Uh, but the cost, if your cost of transportation goes down, as it would with a pipeline, your unit production cost is less, so you actually have the finances to produce more of it. Uh, the the, the uh, Carbon Tracker estimates that companies could produce an additional 525,000 barrels of oil per day out of these tar sands if the Keystone XL pipeline is built. Which means the pipeline would be responsible for generating a whole lot more greenhouse gas emissions than the State Department accounted for because it would be facilitating the more rapid growth of tar sands production, which in turn would create its own emissions, that additional production. And what's more, here's, a, here's an important point. In all of the Keystone generated emission scenarios that were considered by the State Department, none of them, not a single one, would meet the U.S.'s declared target of cutting greenhouse gas emissions by 17 percent below 20, 20, 2005 levels by 2020. The emissions estimate are not only not consistent with that, they are not consistent with the goal of limiting global warming to no more than 2 degrees Celsius, which is what scientists say is the limit we should, we should shoot for. In fact, they are in line with trends that would see a 6 degrees Celsius, that's like an 11 degree Fahrenheit, rise in average global temperatures by the end of the century, an increase that would be considered and is considered by scientists disastrous. So fortunately, there is some good news to be found in the other update about this. It's that the process by which the route for the pipeline across the state of Nebraska uh, was involved, the way that route was approved, it involved taking the authority to make the decision away from the state's Public Service Commission and giving it directly to Governor Dave Heineman, who gave the TransCanada Corporation, the outfit that will be building the pipeline, permission to build it on private land. Now, a state court judge in Nebraska has said that that process was illegal. So as of now, unless a higher court reverses that decision, TransCanada may have to reroute the entire pipeline or else seek permission from every property owner whose land the pipeline would cross. That could set back the whole schedule for the pipeline for at least a year. And frankly, the more this is delayed, the more the opposition to it increases and the more the opportunity for in, uh, opposition increases. Now, personally, I still think that Barack Obama wants to approve this project if he can just find a way to do it without getting too much backlash from his supporters among environmentalists. But right now, I have to admit, I'm a little hopeful, just a little, but I'm getting a little hopeful that maybe we can actually kill this thing. And uh, we're going to take a break. Welcome back. Not that you went anywhere. Uh, I've got some more updates uh, about other issues or things that I've talked about. The first one is um, it's a fair amount of news on a topic that I have talked about a lot recently because it's been in the news a lot recently, uh, same-sex marriage. Uh, 
Now, I mentioned, I guess it was two weeks ago, I think it was, uh, a ruling by federal judge John Hayburn that um, Kentucky's refusal to recognize same-sex marriages legally performed in other states or countries uh, was an unconstitutional violation of the equal protection provisions of the U.S. Constitution. And he gave the state of Kentucky until March 20th in order to remedy that. On March 4th, Kentucky State Attorney General Jack Conway announced he would not be appealing that decision, saying that doing so would be defending discrimination and he wouldn't do that. He is now the seventh state attorney general to refuse or decline to appeal a court ruling that was favorable to the rights of same-sex couples. Uh, the other states, by the way, are California, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Nevada, Virginia, and Oregon. Now, in response to the announcement, Kentucky Governor Steve Beshear said the state would hire outside counsel in order to pursue an appeal. Uh, attorneys for those who filed the suit uh, said that they really don't care who handles the appeal because the legal issues are the same and they're confident they're going to win anyway. Meanwhile, Texas became the latest domino to fall. District Judge Orlando Garcia ruled last week that the state's ban on same-sex marriage and its refusal to recognize marriages performed legally in other states are both unconstitutional, citing the same Supreme Court precedent and constitutional provisions that, uh, that other judges have. Garcia wrote in his order, quoting him, without a rational relation to a legitimate governmental purpose, state-imposed inequality can find no refuge in our U.S. Constitution. He acknowledged in his ruling that uh, regulation of marriage has traditionally been left up to the states. However, any state law involving marriage or any other protected interest has to be in line with the Constitution. Now, as is common in such matters, um, Garcia uh, stayed the effect of his order pending, a, pending uh, an appeal. And Texas Attorney General Greg Abbott said, oh yeah, the state's absolutely going to appeal this. Although he said that because Garcia stayed the effect of his order, eh, there's really no rush about filing an appeal. Which actually makes me wonder how confident he is about winning on appeal. Because you figure if he was confident of winning, he'd just want to go get it overturned and be done with it. It sounds to me more like he's dragging his feet, trying to drag this out as long as he can. Nationwide, seven states now have seen either their, uh, their, their bans on same-sex marriage struck down either in whole or in part in the last 65 days. Similar legal battles are now underway in 24 other states. One of those states is Michigan, where the administration of Governor Rick Snidely Whiplash is trying the tack of, it's for the children, it's all for the sake of the children, claiming kids thrive best when they're raised by a mommy married to a daddy. Um, Apparently, they figured out that this business of saying, well, it's none of the U.S. Constitution's business, is not going to fly. Well, now, one obvious and fatal flaw in this it's all about the children argument uh, is that, that the presence or lack of children or the presence or lack of a desire to be parents has never been related to recognition of the right to get married. Uh, if you're going to say that children are some kind of requirement, well, infertile couples couldn't get married. The elderly could not get married. Oh, you've had a, you've had a vasectomy, you've had a hysterectomy, sorry, you can't get married. And we don't do that. Um, if the answer you get to that is, oh, no, 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 we're not talking about all that. We're just talking about where children could be present. Uh, then the state would also have to be trying to ban divorce, which, you know, it's not. In fact, Michigan's case here was not helped by the fact that one of its two key witnesses was sociologist Mark Regnerus of the University of Texas. He's claimed to have shown in his research that children are better off with opposite-sex parents than with same-sex parents. His research has been dismissed by the American Sociological Association as fundamentally flawed on conceptual and methodological grounds, and even his employer, the Sociology Department of the University of Texas, felt it necessary to distance itself from his testimony. And the thing is, in fact, if you actually dig into his findings, if you actually dig into his results, what you find is that the difference 
in, in performance of the children, welfare of the children, is not a difference between same-sex parents and opposite-sex parents. It's the difference between stable families and unstable families. And since recognizing same-sex marriage would enable such couples to establish more stable families, his research could actually be said to argue in favor of same-sex marriage. Uh, moving on to another state, uh, this is a more subtle advancement. In a new statement, uh, uh, Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper, and that's his real name, it's a wonderful name, and it's his real name, John Hickenlooper, uh, he referred to supporting same-sex marriage for the first time. Before, he's been a supporter of civil unions, and in fact, just recently, he said something about trying to emphasize that civil unions are not the same thing as marriage, but now he has said about approving marriage rights for everyone. Apparently, just like Barack Obama did, he has evolved on the issue. Uh, and finally on this, also with a Colorado connection, we have the Bob Dylan Subterranean Homesick Blues You Don't Need a Weatherman to Know Which Way the Wind is Blowing Award. Federal judges, as I've talked about before, in Utah and Oklahoma ha have issued orders striking down those states' bans on same-sex marriage. Those, both those decisions are on appeal to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals in Denver. Well, now a group of 20 Republicans, led by former Senators Alan Simpson of Wyoming and Nancy Kassenbaum of Kansas, uh, this group has issued an amicus curiae brief. This is a friend of the court brief, and I'm sh you know what these mean, but just in case you don't. The idea is that uh, a, a, a friend of the court brief is filed by some people or group or whatever who aren't actual parties to the case, but feel they have a contribution to make to the arguments for one side or the other. So they filed a friend of the court brief in support of the plaintiffs, that is, in support of legalizing gay marriage. In its conclusion, the brief said, quoting, It is precisely because marriage is so important in producing and protecting strong and stable family structures that we do not agree that the government can rationally promote the goal of strengthening families by denying civil marriage to same-sex couples which seems to me I said pretty much the same thing a minute or two about Mark Regnerus's, Regnerus's work. This fight is not over, not by a long shot, but the thing is when we are now seeing right-wingers using right-wing arguments, quoting Ronald Reagan and Barry Goldwater in support of same-sex marriage, you know which way the wind is blowing. You have to know that on this issue, justice is winning. Uh, last update. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, I talked about Kansas, uh, the Kansas House of Representatives, passing a bill that would allow any public or private employee to refuse any service to gay or lesbian Americans so long as they claim it's because they oppose marriage equality. After the bill passed the House, it drew national attention with the result that it immediately died in the state Senate. Arizona, you probably know, passed a similar bill. The legislature passed it, but ultimately it was vetoed by Governor Jan Brewer after lots of opposition from businesses, especially the tourism industry, and even from state Republicans, including three of them who voted for the thing in the legislature and then changed their minds. That veto proved to be very popular. According to, an, according to a poll, 72% of Arizonans supported the veto. Now, the thing is, though, uh, this is another fight that you have to know is long from over. One way you can tell is that it wasn't just Kansas, it wasn't just Arizona. Similar bills have been introduced in recent weeks in Idaho, Oregon, South Dakota, Tennessee, Hawaii, Ohio, Oklahoma, Mississippi, Georgia, and Missouri. The good news here is that all of these bills are dead or moribund or in serious trouble, with the exception of the one in Missouri, which was only introduced on March 3rd and hasn't even been scheduled for a hearing yet, uh, but which is already facing opposition. But it's still important, still important to note this and to do this update, because you've got to remember, these bills were just a way for the wacko right-wing uh, religious nuts, the fundamentalist nuts, to enable themselves and their kindred souls to continue to be bigots, to carve out an exception for themselves so they could continue to discriminate, discriminate against the LGBT community by claiming that they are the oppressed. 
They're claiming that they are being oppressed as Christians. It's an oppression of their religious freedom. And they're not even saying that it's their little flaky corner of, of Christianity that's being oppressed. They say Christians are being oppressed. All Christians. It's oppression of Christianity, destruction of religious freedom. They're claiming they speak for all of Christianity, which clearly they're not since a number of religious groups have supported same-sex rights. But the point is that it's just another case of religion being used as a cover for bigotry. It's been done before. It's being done now. And sort of related to that, we're going to wrap up with the other regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. This is sort of like a point of personal privilege, if you will. If you apply to be a United States citizen, you're asked to declare your willingness to bear arms in defense of the country. Uh, there is a conscientious objector exception to that. Well, Adriana Ramirez is a California woman who applied for American citizenship. And according to the statement from the Citizenship and Immigration Services, which is the federal agency that handles these matters, according to the statement from that agency, her application was rejected because she identified herself as a conscientious objector on secular moral grounds rather than religious ones. Ms. Ramirez, you see, is an atheist and that got her rejected for citizenship. Now this decision is so blatantly illegal, so blatantly unconstitutional, that I expect it will be overturned in short order. But what makes this the outrage is that nearly 50 years after the Supreme Court ruled that moral and ethical beliefs are the constitutional and legal equivalent of religious ones held with equal intensity, held with equal strength, we still have to keep fighting this battle by battle, time after time. Those of us who are atheists have to keep proving over and over again that yes, we do have morals, yes, we do have ethics, and yes, we do believe we can, we can formulate those convictions without feeling the need for a God to instruct us in matters of right and wrong. And yes, we are by all rights equal citizens. Now, I don't claim, I never have claimed, I never will claim that the discrimination faced by atheists equals that faced by many others of different races, religions, ethnicities, uh, um, genders, uh, uh, sexual preferences, and so on. But I do say that discrimination is real. Or can you name me a single state in this country where it is illegal for a person of any religion to hold public office. No, it's not the worst discrimination. In fact, I will say that personally, I have never experienced discrimination as an atheist, unless you want to count the fact that when I lived in Virginia, I felt it was better to avoid the subject of religion altogether. But uh, I have not really experienced discrimination as an atheist. So it's not the worst discrimination, but that does not mean that this is not an outrage. All right, that's it for this week. We are done. I am out of here. Uh, I'll be talking more about a lot of things. So much to talk about. I haven't talked at all about Ukraine, so I need to talk more about that. Lots of things I need to talk about. But for now, you just have the best week you possibly can. And peace.